Today we're going to continue in the Romance in the Sands, and so we're going to trust God to regulate us even further. Let's pray. Father Lord, here we are, about to enter into the participation of your spiritual food. In the same way we would never take for granted that we have physical food to eat, we do not take it for granted that we have come here to receive of your food. Lord, unfold the riches in your hidden manner to us, Lord. Change our spiritual constituents in the name of Jesus. Let us enjoy, enter into the enjoyment of your fatness in your word. Your word is your very self. And so, Lord, as we eat you, we declare we will never remain the same. You will change us from the inside out. Not so that we can gain fame for ourselves. No, no, no. So that you can be glorified. That we will be the ones who will carry out a good testimony. And you will take all the glory. Do it, Lord. Minister to hearts. Minister to spirits and souls. Lord, your word, you said, it is spirit and it is life. So let the word which is spirit transcend every barrier today, Lord. And let it reach us individually and collectively and bring forth life. Life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Well, very quickly we're going to go into it because we have run out of time and the Lord is with us. Okay, Romance of the Psalms, the today's title really is, is following in the same vein of what we started a couple of weeks ago, and uh, which is maximizing life through our communion, communion with God. We started that two weeks ago with Minister Dyer, and I continued last week, and last week we talked about the fact that in this communion with, uh, with God through the Holy Spirit, that the glorification which we see in the prayer of Jesus, which he says, Father, now the hour is time for it to come that you will glorify me and glorify yourself, is the fact that we the saints are the means by which Christ is glorified and the Father is glorified through the genuine church. We see that in John chapter 17, verses 1 to 6. The glorification really is none other than the fact that Jesus has been given power over all flesh, and because we are of God, given to Christ, Christ said he has given the church, the saints who make up the genuine church, eternal life. And that's the life by which we live by. That eternal life is really essentially the John 10, 10 life. And you might be thinking that John 10, 10 life, eternal life, is that not the eternal life that we will live when we go to heaven? Yes, forever. Yes, it is. But the same life that we'll live when we get to heaven is the life of God that always existed before creation. Amen. And so if that life existed before creation, hallelujah, that life is eternal, meaning that it exists now, amen, and it will exist for eternity. Praise the Lord. Now, that is a life that we were given whenever we believed into Christ Jesus. Why? Because Jesus recognized that when we come into this world, we need to, we were, in a, in, in a, we were of the fallen world. That's what happened when Adam and Eve fell. And being in the fallen world, there is tyranny, there is death, there's deadening, there's bondage, there's pain, there's sorrow, there's all manner of negativity. So how does a saint in the church live through all of that in their own strength? No, they could never. However, once they receive the eternal life, the John 10, 10 life, Jesus said, I have come to give life that cannot be stolen, amen, cannot be killed, amen, and cannot be destroyed. That is how we live in the church through that John 10, 10 life. And I declare concerning each and every one of us, that is our enjoyment. Amen. That is our reality Amen. in Jesus' name. Eternal life of Christ brings us into the fact that Christ is real. And so we have an in Christ reality. Praise the Lord. For the people on the street, they don't understand that. But we know that we are not alone because the Bible talks about the fact that the one who was the last Adam has become the life-giving spirit on the inside of us. So the spirit that gives life and resides in us. Amen. And so if the spirit that gives life is in us, we should commune with that spirit. Praise the Lord. And so we have that. Last week we also talked about this in Christ reality. is really an abiding. It's, and this abiding is based on the word of God that is constant 
and it's regulated by the Holy Spirit. How did we get there? When you come to 1 Corinthians 1, 9, it talks about the call, fact that we've been called into a fellowship. That fellowship is an abiding, is a living together, is a relationship, amen. How do we come about the fact that it's based on the word of God that is constant? Well, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 18, it talks about the fact that the word of God that being preached, being received, that we believed in, is not yesterday, no tomorrow. All the promises of God in Christ are always yesterday. Yes, and amen. amen. And then when you come to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, it talks about the fact that the only way people like you and I can escape the temptation in a world that is fallen, and that's a world in which there's pain, tyranny, hurt, uh, destruction, all manner of evil, is through the fact that we have the Holy Spirit that portrays, that makes a way of escape. For us. Hallelujah. And that's why we are able to escape all forms of temptation. And then we talked about that this in Christ reality is frustrated by the evil one because one, there's a lack of God's presence in the lives of the, uh, it being lived out in the lives of the saints or in the body of the Christ, body of Christ. The fact that there's no real body life among the brethren and even our understanding of the Bible is quite, uh, is, 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 is found wanting. And what is the remedy? Simply, let's get to the place where we begin to practice the presence of the Lord by rejoicing at all times, wherever we are. Praise the Lord. Let's make brotherly love the fact that that is what God uses to build his church. Let that make it, make it that a priority in our own life. Brotherly life, brotherly love. Not looking out for our own good only, but preferring one another and desiring the sincere milk of the word. Those are the remedies for going forward. Today, we're going to romance the Psalms a bit deeper than we've done in recent weeks. And today, I want to use Psalm 106. And if you're reading the Psalms and with us, what Psalm are we reading today? 106. Yeah, no prizes for guessing that. It's 106. Uh, we're on the middle section today, and next, uh, tomorrow we'll be finishing the back end of the three parts in which it's divided into. So in 106, verse 1 to 3, it says, Praise the Lord. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is, and his mercies. And verse 2 talks about the fact, who can utter the mighty acts of the Lord? Who can declare all his praises? Blessed are those who keep justice, and he who does righteousness all the time. Praise the Lord. And when you come to the last two verses of that same scripture, and I've got it there. The last two verses, it says that, Save us, O Lord our God. Gather us from among Gentiles. Give, to give thanks to your holy name, to triumph in your praise. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for everlasting to everlasting. And let the people say, Amen. Oh, that praise the Lord was let we Let the people say, Hallelujah. And so really, essentially, we're doing what the psalmist was talking about, which is to praise the Lord in every situation. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. But have you noticed how that psalm starts? It starts with praise the Lord, and it finishes with praise the Lord. Hallelujah. What it means that whatever you go through on a day-to-day -day basis, it should start with a? Praise the Lord. And end with a? Praise the Lord. That's practicing his presence there already. Irrespective of the phone call you get, the email that's coming through, or the text that you pick, you wake up to read, to read, it's all about that. And I think really one of the things you find in the Psalm 103 and 106, and from 103 all the way to about 106, they're all what we call the Hallelujah Psalms. Why Hallelujah Psalms? Because now God is gaining a name for himself through what he has done in the life of the people of God, and they have come to realize it, and they're not content to keep it to themselves. They're sharing among themselves, and they're asking the people of the world to say, see what our God has done in spite of our history. So come Come and join us and hallelujah that is what it is God is gaining what he desires a people for himself who recognize that their position and their responsibility is to continually praising him making his name great whenever you come to Sam the verse 3 
of, of that psalm. In verse 3 of that psalm, he says, who keeps, who, who talking about a blessed is the one who keeps uh, justice and, and, and who does righteous at all times. No man can do that. There's no man, no man on this face of earth that can keep justice and do righteousness all the time. But we know one who can, and his name is? Jesus, Jehovah, amen. He, he can do that. And that's the reason why they say? Oh, hallelujah, praise the Lord. You know what? In the Hebrew Bible, it won't say praise the Lord. It will say? Hallelujah. And so when they recognize that, even though in me, in myself, I cannot do justice all the time, I cannot do righteousness all the time, but I have a God in heaven who does it on my behalf all the time, they shout? Hallelujah. And then when you come to the tail end, he's saying, oh, gather us from among the Gentiles, which means to recover us from the world. That's what happened. Whenever you believed in Christ Jesus, you were born. I was born into a fallen world. But in spite of us being born into a fallen world, God had my hand, name written on the hand of his hands. And so there was a day when I, God called me, I responded, and I said, Lord Jesus, become the Lord of my heart. And he recovered me unto himself. That means I was stolen by the enemy, but God has now brought me back to my original place. So they shout, Hallelujah, Lord. And that's why you see that that psalm finishes with hallelujah. And when you actually understand, when you read the Psalm 106, you will come to realize that this psalm is one of those psalms that's full of history. It will talk about the church or the people of Israel in the land of bondage, talking about the fact that they forgot what God did when they were in the land of bondage and how God made sure that when the enemies pursued them, nobody remained. That's history, talking about the goodness of God in their lives. Oh, has God not been good to us? Has God not been good to you in 2019? So what should your response be? Praise God. You do know the moment you say hallelujah, you're practicing the presence of the Lord. That's all it takes. Amen. There's, there's no ten ways of practicing the presence of the Lord. I can imagine you could write a book and put 10 things and, in, in your prayer screen, but listen, just shouting hallelujah, that's the presence of the Lord. Yeah, amen. I don't know why we human beings like the hard way. And then he talks about the fact that even when they were in the wilderness, in the wilderness, God provided them with manna. And they said, Lord, no, no, we've had enough of this manna. We don't even know what it is, which is exactly what it means. What is it? What is it? It's a mystery because Christ is God's all-important, all-inclusive blessing for us. Amen. Hallelujah. And they tried to figure out what it is. So they said, oh, Lord, we don't want this anymore. We've had enough. And so God asked, okay, what do you want? They want the cucumber. They want the garlic. They want the curls. And God said, okay, have loads of it. They ate it to their food. But guess what? There was still a hunger in there because only Christ will satisfy us. And that is a John 10, 10 life. And I declare each and every one of us, that becomes our living reality going forward in Jesus' name. Then you see that not only that, it focuses on God's dealing with the people. You see God's dealing at various times. You know, there was a time when there was no water. God said, say, okay, I'm standing in front of the, in front of the rock. Hit the rock and water will come out. Another time, God tells Moses, okay, now this time I just speak to the rock. And Moses obviously being relayed and being under the pressure and the stress of the people. What he, what he, he heard what God said, but what he did was totally different. And God had to deal with him. Oftentimes when God is dealing with his people, you must know that the son that the father loves, he chastised. So, so all the God's dealings are not, are not bad. God's dealings are there for his own transformation so that he can get what he wants to get out of us. Praise the Lord. And so in fact, when you think about the dealings of God, is it possible that the whole issue about the rebellion of the sons of Korah and, 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 and the courts, that when God took them out of the picture by let's making sure they were swallowed alive, is so that God can still preserve people for his own, for his own gain eventually. Amen? Praise the Lord. And so sometimes it's important that even with these as dealings of God by faith, we must be able to say, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And then it talks about the fact that the dealings are justice and righteousness based on his grace. Remember what it says. It talks about the fact that who can. They say, blessed are those who keep justice. God keeps justice. Blessed are those who do man, righteousness all time. God is always righteous. Amen. And it is those things that we, we enter into the enjoyment as the saints. 
In Psalms 89, verse 14. We see Psalms 89, verse 14. 14 to 17, it says, Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Whose throne? And God's throne has a foundation of righteousness and justice. And it says, mercy and truth go before your face. In fact, where did you, where, where, where have we come across something similar like that? That fact that the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus. Hallelujah. So almost there, you can see that there's something woven in there that says that, yes, God's throne, which is all full of righteousness and mercy and, and righteousness and justice, but in its real actual application in our life, it is based on his mercy, praise the Lord, and his truth. Amen. And he says, blessed are those who do what? Know, that, the, know the joyful sound. To know the joyful sound, it means that you're listening to something. Amen. And so rather than looking at the reality of day-to-day -day living of, in a fallen world, which is full of the, the, the deadening, the, 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 the tyranny, the, the, the Brexit, the, the, the knife crime, the pain and all that. No, no, no. You look at Jesus, amen, the author and the finisher of our faith. And when you lift up to him, you hear the joyful sound, amen, of mercy and truth, hallelujah, through the communion of the Holy Spirit. And then he starts with, they walk, O Lord, in the light of your countenance. Whenever it is all about Christ Jesus, you are not walking in darkness, amen. You are not walking in a lie. You are walking according to his own countenance. Why? Because you carry the countenance of God on the inside of you. In, one of the, in some of the Psalms, you will see the Psalms say, ah, that I will worship towards your holy temple. No, 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 no. We don't worship towards. You know what it means to worship? it towards the temple is in that direction and so I turn my head to that direction oh maybe when I move to another direction the temple has now gone in that direction and I'm, no 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 the temple is not moved anywhere the temple is and so I worship the Lord in my heart amen by practicing the spirit and that's why I say praise the Lord somebody and that is what it means that it then, that his counselor becomes our light because of the communion of the Holy Spirit. And so under grace, the communion with the Holy Spirit brings us into an enjoyment that the psalmist has to write about is something that I long for. No, 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 we don't long for it. We enjoy it. Praise the Lord. And so today, as we talk about the foundation of God's throne, I want us to talk about the foundation of God's throne. Because I know as we live in a fallen world, Oftentimes, we do not allow the John 10, 10 life to become a practical reality. I know there are ways in which we've talked about the John 10, 10 life, about the abundant life of everything you want and everything you need. But, but remember, this, this, thing, this life is beyond what you want or what you need. It's about God's life on the inside of you through which he directs you, regulates you, ministers to you, orchestrates you, leads you, and guides you. Praise the Lord. And so, oftentimes, not understanding this can become a means of the evil one actually deluding us and discouraging us, stealing from us, destroying us, or even killing the things that we're meant to carry to the glory of God. That will not be our portion in Jesus' name. So, in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1, what does it say unto? Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on. Somebody say, go on. Say, go on. I declare in the tail end of this year, you are going on to perfection. Yeah. You're leaving the rudimentaries behind. No, you will hold on to those rudimentaries, but you will build upon them in the name of Jesus. You will not go backwards, you are going forward. Yeah. He says, not laying again the foundation of repentance from, God, from dead works or, or, and of faith towards God, of doctrine, of baptisms, mind the S, uh, or laying on of hands or faith resurrection of the dead and of the of eternal judgment he's saying that listen where we are is that yes there are the they are the elementary the rudimentaries of the principles of christ their foundations 
But now you've got to be, we have to get to the place where we're building upon those things. Because unless we are get to the place where we understand the foundations and now are beginning to build, the enemy is stealing from us and is not allowing God to gain what he wants to gain through us, the genuine church. Hallelujah. And so the enemy will show us things and, and, uh, and we will believe it because we haven't understood the elementaries of the principles of the foundations of things like repentance from dead works, faith towards God, doctrine of baptisms, laying on of hands, re the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. And my prayer is that as we talk about those very quickly today, we are going to enter in an enjoyment, amen, that will allow us to now begin to build so that God can gain what he wants to gain, amen. God, has, God sees us beyond just saints coming together. God wants to take the nation through you and I, amen. God wants to take the place wherever you work through you in the name of Jesus, amen. Yes, you want to climb up the corporate ladder, but God wants you, when you get to the corporate ladder, to do his bidding, amen. So God wants to make sure he starts that work of transformation right now so that when you get to the corporate ladder at the top you're not saying ah oh, so God what do I need to do no 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 you already know what to do because God is regulating you God is leading you God is transforming you God is molding you into what he wants for his own gain amen praise the Lord and so when you look at it I've divided all those six items put them into three groups and each in, in each group I put two so the first two the next two, and the last two. And so let's look at the first one. Repentance from dead works and faith towards God. That when you come to realize what that really means, you realize that you have been recovered. Praise the Lord. What is recovery means that something that was lost has been recovered. Something that the enemy stole when man fell in the garden, God has now recovered it to himself. I declare you will always walk in the recovery. Every dream that the enemy thought he has stolen, you are recovering in the name of Jesus. Grounds that the enemy thought he had, you have lost, guess what? You will recover in the name of Jesus. And then the next two is the doctrine of baptisms. If you look at your Bible, it's important that these words, that whenever it's called an S, it's there for a reason. It doesn't say the doctrine of baptism. It says baptisms. And then and laying on of hands. That will lead to revival. You see, Whenever God recovers his saints, the means of recovery, which is the Holy Spirit that massaged your heart and you responded to, is the same Holy Spirit by which he now begins to start the work of transformation, reviving. Amen. So guess what? Not only will you recover, but the Lord revives you. You live by the life of God. You operate by the life of God. The life of God that cannot be killed is in you. The life of God that cannot be stolen is in you. The life of God that cannot be destroyed cannot, is in you. Amen. Because there is a revival already taking place. So revival is not about the fact that we bring a man in here or even I call a 20-day fast and then I go lock myself up in 21 in a room for two months before I come out, not looking at any daylight and all that. And when I come in, I say, yes, no, 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 no. The revival is already there. You have the Spirit of God. Amen. Begin to commune with that Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord, somebody. Because the means of revival is already in you. The life-giving spirit. Praise the Lord. And then when you look at the last two, resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. That is the fact that whenever you talk about resurrection, before you can get resurrection, something has to... Yes! And so whenever we're talking about resurrection, we're talking about power over death. Not to prevent death. No, you see, to prevent death is one thing. And you can, you can boast that you prevented death. But it's another thing to have died and rise up again. Now that one, there's no, you can't argue with that. You can argue that, well, maybe you took the right vitamins, you were lucky, that's why you were able to prevent it. But on this one, died and rose up again. In fact, it's glaring, it's glaring. Praise the Lord. And that's the life that we carry. Praise the Lord. For God to get the restoration. God allows the enemy to see. Okay, God says, listen, do your worst. Death. All right, now I'm about to start my beginning. That's not even my all because my all is that the one that died that I do that raised up again, I'm now going to use it to build up my house, build up my family, build up a body, build up a bride, build up a, a temple for my a kingdom for myself. So God says, listen, what's your worst? Death. Now let me put life into that death. And, let's turn right. and that's our portion in Jesus' name. Praise the Lord, somebody. Let's put our hands together for the Lord. 
So very quickly, as we go through these slides, you might want to take pictures, but I'm going to rush through them. So our day-to-day -day reality of Hebrews chapter 6, verses 1 to 2 is this. When I talk about repentance from dead works and faith on to, towards God, which leads to recovery, what am I saying? In Mark chapter 1, verse 15, the Bible says in verse 14 that uh, John had been put in prison. And Jesus is now taking the stage and is now preaching. And he's telling the people to, let's put the scriptures on the screen, please. And it talks about the fact that Jesus talks about that they should repent because the kingdom of God is at hand. Praise the Lord. And so really, there is a kingdom that is now coming into play that is now snatching those who were stolen by the fallen world into the kingdom of darkness. Praise the Lord. And thank God we are the saints that Christ came for, died for, so that we can be recovered back to our rightful owner. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And so really, that repentance is not something that we could get engineered. We were not involved in it. Jesus done it all. Amen. And so the worst thing you can now do is now that you're a saint, is to now begin to say that now that I've been reasoning to Christ Jesus, now this is what I need to do. No, it's not about what you've got to do. It's about what Christ has done. Amen. You could never save yourself because Christ has now become the end of the law for righteousness for those who believe. So any form of righteousness that you have is never going to be based on what you do. The number of hours you pray, the number of times you say thank you, the number of times you, your, your this or that. No, no, no. It's about what Christ has done and believing into that which Christ has done. Praise the Lord. And that brings us to the next stage. We talks about the fact that, so in terms of the, the, the repentance, the repentance is an act that Christ did that takes us out of the negative and puts us in the positive. And so that's why Paul would say in Ephesians chapter 1, 4, 4 verse 1, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1, he says, therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord beseech you to walk worthy of the calling which you were called. Paul initially was a prisoner of the world. Remember, before he knew Christ, he was actually the bad man. He was, Paul was bad. But now that he has received Christ into, into the Lord, he now recognizes, I am a prisoner of a different master now. The one who owns me, the one who has captivated me, who has captured me is Christ Jesus. And that's who we are. We are now prisoners to Christ, yielding to a new master, to the glory of God. And so nothing can steal us away from that Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So let's talk about faith towards God. When you come to Hebrews chapter 11, the hallmark of the hall, the, the hall, of, hall of fame of um, the fame of, hall of fame of faith. Yeah. You find that people have done on many things. You talk about Enoch, he talks about Abel, he talks about Moses, he talks about Abraham, Jacob, he talks about Joseph, he talks about everything that they've done. But do you realize everything they did was based on the fact that there was in their spirit, not that they, they knew intrinsically themselves, but because there was a leading of God working on the inside of them, they moved at the fact that now faith is the substantiating or the substance of things hoped for. God placed a hope in their heart. God gave them a word of what he wanted to do, and they stepped out based on the word of God by the Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord. When the one had to live in a tent, not building up a, a house for himself, talking about Abraham and his children, they lived in tents because they were looking forward to a city that is a city of God, not made by hands or any man. Praise the Lord. And so really what we're seeing that our faith towards God is being regulated by the Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord. The Holy Spirit ministers to you, begins to push you in a direction. As he's pushing you in a direction, you begin to realize this is what I carry. And so really, that whole recovery of God is for you to discover what he wants you to be in life, discover what he has placed in you for his own goal, discover, in what, discover the graces that he wants you to use for his own glory. Amen. So recovery leads to discovery. Praise the Lord. Recovery leads to and you know this is just about us working in the reality of the three Ds, discover, develop, and deploy to the glory of God, the hidden gifts and potentials that you carry. Praise the Lord. And so we can never really get that discovery except we allow the Holy Spirit to minister to us. Oh, yeah, it's easy. You can listen to my, what my dreams are, and you say, well, you know what? This is what Pastor Collar's dream is, you know, so I'm going to make it my dream. No, 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 no. Two things. What if... The dreams that I said that are mine were not actually ordered by the Holy Spirit, and I'm working in the flesh. So we've got two blind people running after something. 
But even if it was me, my dream was given to me by the Holy Spirit, what about you allowing God to show you the same way he showed me my dreams for my own spirit, for my own future? That's what communion with the Holy Spirit does. That's where you come into discovery. Praise the Lord. Very quickly, let's go to the next one. So now I'm talking about the next two, doctrines of baptisms and of the laying on of hands. Now when you come to the Bible, where it talks about baptisms in that portion, look at Strong's Dictionary. The other two places that you're likely to find it is in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 10, where the writer of Hebrews is talking about the fact that you do not need to observe all these performances anymore because of who you have got, which is the Christ who is now become your heavenly uh, um, uh, high priest. Praise the Lord. And that he has done it all. But number two, in Mark chapter 7, verse 4, you will see Jesus chastising all the, 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 the elders. And he says that, listen, you elders, you have, gone, you have done away with the word of God and you've brought your own traditions that says when you get to the marketplace, you wash your hands. If you're going to eat, you wash all the utensils. And, and he says, on the outside, you're looking good, but on the inside, you're far from God. And so what is this saying? What we're saying is that when the writer of Hebrews is talking about, don't start laying all the foundation on the, uh, of the baptisms because he's saying that the ceremonial washes are not ne needed anymore. The one washing that you needed has taken place. Amen. And that is what we find in Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4. The fact that we have been baptized into the death of Christ. Amen. And through his death and resurrection, we have now been made alive and brought into the newness of life. Amen. And so really, where one is the negative, which is the baptism uh, the doctrine of, of baptism, where you have to keep on doing and doing and doing, Jesus has done it. Amen once and for all act, never to be repeated. Amen. Praise the Lord. And so what he's talking about is that now, what is the other side of that? Now that you have been baptized and now have the newness of life, the next thing for you to understand is that you enjoy the laying on of hands or the impartation, identification, union because of the Holy Spirit that you carry. Yes, we know that Paul talks about to Timothy says that, that in the first place, remember, me and the elders, we've prayed for you by the laying of the hands. Then he talks about the later ones that talk about that we stir up the gift that's already in you because of the laying of my hands upon you. What he's affirming is that listen, you already carry something. Somebody say, I carry something. You carry grace. Amen. And so, in the same way when I was ordained as a pastor here, and uh, Daddy Bishop uh, well, okay, put his hand upon me, he was confirming that which God has already placed in, praise the Lord. I can assure you, whenever a man of God might, or anybody prays for you and puts their hand, they're not transferring something from heaven, you already have it. You carry something. You carry something. So you don't need to be running around. Run to the God that you carry in the spirit. Amen. Amen. Get on your knees and pray. Praise the Lord. Get your Bible out and begin to commune with the Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord. You carry something. Amen. Amen. In fact, when you come to um, Romans, no, no. Can you put Ephesians 4, 7, and 8? Ephesians 4, 7, and 8. Praise the Lord, somebody. He says, but to each one of us, grace was given according to... Now, let's look at that. But to each one. So whenever you see, but to each one, you know what that, does that mean? Only the pastor have the grace. Okay, just me and the board of ministers, right? Okay, those who come for Friday night prayer. All, every one of us. You carry something. And so once you understand that you carry grace, let's go to the next stage. According to, he says, therefore he says, when he ascended on high, he led us captive. Amen. Praise the Lord. Because we were in captivity in the old fallen world. Now he led us captive. Amen. Took us to heaven and gave gifts to. So guess what? Now the church is the gift to the world to bring light and salt into the world. And the enemy would not want us to know that so that God does not gain what he wants to gain. Praise the Lord, somebody. And so once you understand that and you know that you're carrying something, you know that it leads you to the second D, which is to develop. 
Now you're not thinking about what do I carry? You already uh, know that you carry something. Lord, show me how to develop it. And that's why when we say, come out, let's go do be, come preaching once on Sundays or on Saturday, outreach. There are many gifts and graces that you carry that God wants to use. Can you imagine? My brother over there and my sister there, you pair up and you go onto the streets and you see somebody, they're limping. And you say, hello, man, how are you? You're limping. And she, before she gets, she says, yeah. I, she says, you know, I believe, we believe in the power of prayer. Can we pray for you? And because she's a lady, can say, listen, do you mind if my sister touches the knee? I'll pray. With, I'm not going to touch the knee because I'm a, you, you, don't, you won't need to say I'm a man. But you say, let my sister touch your knee. And she said, okay, yeah, go ahead. And you pray. And with God's providence, God's own prerogative, she said, what did you just do? Praise the Lord. You know you carry the healing anointing. Amen. You're at work. There is a very tough issue to deal with at work on a project, and everybody's going round and round in a circle. Who knows what I'm talking about? Have you ever been there? And so you just say, everybody, you know, I just want to go to the toilet for five minutes. You don't need to tell them that you're going to pray. So leave, leave it to their imagination what you've gone to do. And you get to the toilet, and you're shouting, and you say, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, as I go back, I don't know, but you know, so Lord, I'm relieved. And you get back, and you're listening, and you're listening, and you're listening, and you just say, Guys, what about if we do this, we do this? And they say, oh, that's true, you know. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. That's what we're talking about. That's how you develop the graces that you carry. I was saying in the first service, we had an issue to deal with not too long ago. And in that meeting, I could see that, whoa, this is going to be heated. Lord Jesus, I'm going to need your help now because even I can't even justify what's just happened right now. And then... In the midst of that, I'm praying to the Lord. I'm tapping my finger. I'm underneath my, the table. I'm doing like this, Lord Jesus. I'm praying. I'm listening. I'm praying. I'm moving back, and I'm looking. And, and then Pastor David says, Pastor, do you remember X, Y, Z a number of years ago? I'm thinking, okay, what has that got to do with what we're talking about? And he said, but this happened and that happened. Oh, yeah. And, oh. and the issue, I believe, it, believe me, when we put it on the table, solution everything solved something that could have been messy God himself by regulating us showing us that I carry the grace to listen and somebody has a grace to just perceive godly wisdom bring it into mix we put the two graces together solution and God gets the glory praise the Lord that's what we're talking about developing the graces that you have so don't sit on them once you are beginning to pray commune with the Holy Spirit it is a communion of the Holy Spirit that will enable you to go and deploy it even in schools wherever you are you go and deploy yes maybe it won't show up on every day okay you know okay I'm, I'm not gonna give up but one day you'll realize ah I carry this grace yes I carry that grace there are people here that you think you only have one grace you will have it says, according to the measure of, God's, of Christ's gift. You carry graces that you never know. I declare you begin to operate in those graces Amen. as you develop in Jesus' name. And the last one there is the one that talks about resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. Now, resurrection, as I said earlier, means that something died and it's alive. So that means power over death. I declare each and every one of us, we have power over death. Amen. Oh, situations that you've gone through in the past that haunt you and you feel that you're dead. No, no, no. You have power over those situations Amen. to the glory of God in Jesus' name. And so what are we talking about? You remember when Jesus in, was in, in chapter 22 and then they just come to him and talk to him about the fact that um, this one gets married, that gets married to this lady and all that. And he says, who died? He says, listen, you don't even know the word of God to start with because God that we serve is not the God of the dead. He's a God of the living. Praise the Lord. You know what that means? Yes, in natural terms, you thought those people died. But guess what? Because God is involved, they were all, it's, all, all, it's time to out to sleep because God has power over death. So whenever we lose somebody in the body, they're not dead. They're alive because they were never dead in the first place. You see, we have our own human thing and definition of death. The people who do not know Christ, they're dead already. They're just dead men walking. They're zombies. And, and you know, I'm not being insensitive. I'm just trying to make a point here. And maybe I should just, just come back to where we are. What I'm trying to say is this, is that we were never dead as long as you're in Christ. And so when we transition, we sleep. And so God has given us the power over death. 
at the right time we will arise up. In fact, the Bible talks about the fact that, that when the trumpet is sound, those who are still around and those who are the dead in Christ, they will be caught up together by that clarion call. And I think it's important that you understand that, that the one and for all death of Christ has conquered death. Amen. Do not let anything look impossible. Do not let anything hold you back because nothing can kill the dream that you carry in the name of Jesus. God, in your believing into Christ and recovering you to himself, reviving you, is restoring you back to where he wants you. Amen. You remember when man fell in the garden, he said, whenever you eat of this, you will surely die. Now, guess what? You are now back to the pro pre, you will surely die in Jesus' name. And then, in Romans chapter 5, in Romans chapter 2, verses 5 and 7, he talks about eternal judgment. Now let's talk about judgment. It's oftentimes that when people think about judgment, all they ever think is negative. Especially, especially when you use the word like crisis. Every, all we ever think about crisis is negative. No, crisis means a change in events. Praise the Lord. So I was ill yesterday, but I am healed today. Change in event. Praise the Lord. You were in debt yesterday to the glory of God. God has given you godly wisdom. You've turned things around. You are now financially free. Change in. Change in. Yeah. So crisis is not necessarily just negative. It's a change in event. The same thing for judgment. You do know that one can go to court and the judgment be in my favor. That is a positive outcome, right? So why is it whenever we read about judgment, we always think about the negative? In fact, the Bible will tell, tell us in, in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, it is written according, it is according unto every man to die. After that, hey, every man, including the saints and those who, received, who refused to receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. But the difference is, because of the finished work of Christ, in the resurrection of the dead, the once and for all activity that we were never part of, we know what our judgment is even before time. Praise the Lord. Which means that we are the saints who will reign with Christ, but not only reign, we are the ones who will be transformed into the bride of Christ. Amen. And the house, the new Jerusalem will be built with us. Amen. Now that sounds like a good judgment to me. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And so we must never allow anything like that to hold us back. So guess what? God moves us into the third of the three Ds to deploy. God wants you to be his genuine church in the society. Amen. Praise the Lord. God wants to gain a family. God wants to look at his house and say, yes, look at my family. Now I live in there, my abode. This is where I reside. But guess what? We are taking the nations all over the place. God is seeing a kingdom being taken for himself. And not what is that? Because the body is becoming is the new man. And not only that, we eventually will be the bride, praise the Lord, for God. And as a bride, we are not just a bride, but we are a warring bride. We are fighting on behalf of God to the glory of God in Jesus name that is what it means to deploy so maybe you work in a bank and God is saying you know what I want you to turn this place around how are you going to turn around number one I need this one that one that one that one that one that one just begin to minister to them they might not give them life to Christ they probably will under your ministry or they, maybe they're going through an issue minor issue speak to them befriend them and begin to and you become light amen the company is going in a downward spiral and they say ah, you know there's this guy in that department let's go get him and it happens to be you, you come and sit down and you give them, you, while they're putting the, put the issue on the table, you're praying under your breath and God is saying, tell them to do this, tell them to do that, tell them to do that. And they're thinking, where were you all this while? Where, wh why haven't we made you deputy uh, uh, vice president of this company all this while? Praise the Lord. That's your position in Jesus' name. That's what it means for God to deploy us. Wherever we go, God wants to gain it for himself. And so, the starting point is always recovery. That which was stolen from God in the garden, God recovers to himself. You have been recovered, you will stay recovered. And because you have now been recovered unto God, God now puts his spirit that recovered you, that you commune with now, to revive you, put life into you, develop those giftings, praise the Lord. 
And as you are developing those gifts, then God now begins to deploy you. Deploy you. To restore you back to where your original place was. Which was to be a person who is fruitful. I declare you will be fruitful in the marketplace. Amen. To be a person who multiplies. You will multiply. You know what that means? That means you become a preaching one in your workplace that in an office where the, you are the only believer out of 20 people, guess what? Maybe before the end of next year, there might be five people and all of those five because of you, you've multiplied to the glory of God. Amen. Amen. Then you'll become one who begins to replenish as things are not happening. Guess what? God allows you to be the one, the solution provider. You will replenish in Jesus' name and you will subdue. I know every place, every location has a strong man, but because you turn up with the presence of the Lord, arise, O Lord, and let all your enemies in this workplace be scattered. Not the individuals, but the spirit of the age that is wanting to take over those places. God uses you to deploy you in those places and you turn around place to the glory of his name in Jesus name praise the Lord and so as we close what do we see the Holy Spirit that we commune with is the one that recovers us then revives us so that he can restore us and I declare that is our experience in Jesus name do you remember on New Year's Eve and even after that then in the subsequent messages I was always talking about that the vision that God gave me in this year is that going forward this church in spite of what we've gone through we will recover we will revive and he will restore us praise the Lord and then we now realize that it's not going to be by our own self-effort it is by being in communion with the Holy Spirit praise the Lord somebody and so that Holy Spirit that we've been talking about and have you noticed over the last couple of months, or maybe the last four months, every, nearly every message will have a, an element of the gift of grace, the work of grace, and the goal of grace. Amen. The, and the Holy Spirit that recovers us from the evil one is the gift of grace that has translated us from the kingdom of darkness into his marvelous light. Amen. The Holy Spirit that revives us is the one that is the gift of grace working in us. Hallelujah. And the one that deploys us and restores us is the one that is for us to fulfill the goal of grace. Praise the Lord. Are you seeing how all of this ties into itself? Oh, Lord Jesus. And so you know what I'm shouting every day? I wake up and I look at the household of New Wine Church, the church called New Wine Church. I am saying... So why don't you join me for the last time and say, Hallelujah. one more time for the glory of God, Hallelujah. for what he's doing in your life in, in our church. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Let's put our hands together for the Lord.